to whom I'm going to look, someone who's humble, contrite in heart, and when he reads my word, it makes him tremble, or it means something to him. And I thought of the verse that we've talked about probably every week from Proverbs 9.10 that says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think there's a correlation there that if we fear the Lord, we will tremble at his word. And that's one reason I wanted on your sheet today to, for us to look at what is it that God speaks? How does God speak? And what does God hate? So that we will want to align our words with what God would speak. And then the other thing that he says that might surprise us is that we should tremble at our words. Matthew 12, 36 and 37 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they will give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's why we should tremble at our words. And I thought of a couple of other verses too that are kind of along that line. Very sobering. James 1.26 says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, that man's religion is in vain. And then Psalm 139.4 says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. So today we're going to talk about our conversation and the book of Proverbs, uh, from the book of Proverbs, and it talks about our words, it talks about our lips, our tongue, our mouth, but there are so many verses in Proverbs that talk about those. Uh, it is, it was amazing. Of all the topics that I have taught on, this by far had the most verses that deal directly with our topic. So here we go. I want us to look today at a contrast. Since we're talking about Proverbs, I want us, as we're going through many verses, and I apologize that there are so many, and yet I shouldn't apologize because it's God's Word that is going to change us. And as we're going to see, we cannot control our tongue, but God can, and He uses His Word. He's used it on me in a mighty way the last few weeks <laughs> through these verses. And so... I want us to get, I want us to hear what God has to say, and I want us to tremble at that so that we will align ourselves with what he wants. And I want us to notice a contrast between what the wise and the fool, because that is such a contrast in Proverbs. The wise person's speech, the fool, foolish person's speech. And then one of the things that stood out to me is that I want us to notice what is it that God loves and desires in our speech and what is it that he hates in our speech and what he hates will be what does Satan delight in what is he trying to get us to do and there are verses that tell us that too but our main theme I want us to uh, I got from the book of Proverbs is Proverbs 18:21, and this this contrast they're all three the same the fool the wise what pleases Satan what pleases the Lord and then this verse says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So that's, they're all the same categories, <laughs> but you could just put different labels on them. So, last time when I spoke, we spoke, I, I used James, if you remember, we were talking about behaviors and emotions. And I used uh, the last six verses of the third chapter of James as kind of a compliment because it seemed to go so well. Well, today I'm going to use the first 12 verses of James because they all talk about the tongue. And that's kind of where I got this outline. So we're going to kind of use a compliment between Proverbs and James chapter 3. So first of all, let's look at the deadly power that this little muscle that I understand weighs about two ounces, the deadly power that that thing can cause. First of all, James calls it a fire. James 3, 5, and 6 says, Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among, among our members, 
that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And please notice this. And it is set on fire of hell. Do you see, the, do you see who's behind this kind of tongue? You know, we've all experienced a fire in some way. When I was two days old, my mom and I were in the hospital. I don't remember it, but uh, the house that my parents <laughs> and I had been living in too, but again, I didn't remember it, but burned to the ground. And my dad was able to run in and, re and retrieve one thing. What do you think he would have saved out of that if he only had time to get one thing? Well, that would have been a good thing to <laughs> Their wedding pictures. He, he grabbed their wedding pictures. And so to this day, if you look at one of them, they're all charred around the edges, but they, they made it out. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we watched in horror as Gatlinburg, um, from one spark, look at all the destruction, 14 lives lost, over, uh, over 134 injured, um, over 2,500 people lost their homes because of a spark that turned into a raging fire. And James says, that's what, that's what, that's a deadly destruction that this can cause. Proverbs agrees. Proverbs 16, 27 says, an ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips is a burning fire. Where no wood is, there, there the fire goeth out. So if you run out of wood, your fire's going to go out, right? So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceases, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire. So is a contentious man to kindle strife. Wow. Do you see what that says? And then grievous words stir up anger. If you have a fire that's going out, what do you do sometimes to kind of revive it? You stir those coals up, don't you? And someone who has grievous words can stir that fire back up and get it going again. The mouth of the foolish is near destruction. A fool's mouth in his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. Pastor Stephen Davey says that our tongue is a, me a weapon of mass destruction. And I think he's right. The second thing that uh, James tells us, compares our tongue to, is a wild animal. James 3, 7, and 8 says, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. Notice that it says, no man can tame the tongue. Man can tame all these other wild animals and sometimes get them to do unbelievable things. But the Bible says that no man can tame our tongue. Proverbs 11, 9, an hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. A wild animal. Do you want to be around one of them <laughs> that's just wild and vicious? And uh, What are they out to do many times? Destroy. We'd be afraid that they would. And that's what our, the Bible compares our tongue to. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. Wow. And then James compares our tongue to poison, which, of course, is deadly. James 3.8 says that our tongue is full of deadly poison. So we see that it compares our tongue to a fire, to a wild beast, untamed beast, and to deadly poison. The words of a talebearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. A lying tongue hateth those who are afflicted by it. It's poisonous. And a flattering mouth worketh ruin. The mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. So then I wanted us, I, I went through Proverbs and several times and just made note of the different verses that mention the mouth and the tongue and the lips. And then I made categories out of them. And one word that I don't really ever use as far as a word in my vocabulary is the word froward. But the book of Proverbs uses that word a lot, I noticed, to describe our speech. So I looked it up and it says ornery. 
headstrong, unsubmissive, stubborn, unyielding. So try to think of those words when you think of these verses, okay? And again, tremble at God's word. Let him work in your heart as he did mine about areas where he needs to improve um, our, and maybe just do a total makeover of our speech. To deliver thee from the man that speaketh froward things. Put away from thee a froward mouth. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. Do you see headstrong? Nobody's going to tell me what to do, and you're going to hear that coming out in his or her speech. The froward tongue shall be cut out. The mouth of the wicked speaketh, speaketh frowardness. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Best friends can be separated by the wickedness of this tongue. He that is perverse in his lips is a fool. Grievous words stir up anger. And then I just made note, because again, we're trying to see what pleases the Lord. And the, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that love is kind. Love seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and is gentle. And James 3, we saw last time, tells us that the kind of peace that is from above is easy to be entreated. Now we're going to talk about the talebearer. And uh, pro how many of you have ever played the game at a um, party called gossip? Okay, well that, that game is kind of an object lesson to teach us what happens when we are a talebearer, isn't it? I mean, we may start out, we may say, well, what I said was true. Well, it may be true, but that doesn't mean we have to say it. But even if we started out true... What can happen? By the time it gets back enough times, it's a whole another story, right? But you know what? Gossip, we can play that game, but gossip is so much not a game, is it? Um, the harm that has been done by us spreading things, and I say us, obviously, I mean... It's, it's a vicious, vicious thing that we deal with. You know, lots of times what happens is when we get offended by something, we, what is one thing we, try, we may do? We may go tell somebody else, right? And usually then what's going to happen? Well, first of all, that person is going to be offended, right? Against the person that offended us. So all of a sudden... This person that we told that to may not have ever thought a bad thought about that person, ever. But once we are finished telling our story, you know, we're sharing it as a prayer request maybe, or we're just wanting sympathy, but we tell somebody else, and they start thinking, you know, that's right. I think you're right about that person. And now, now they start thinking negatively, and now they're feeling offended, so they go tell somebody else. You see how the fire gets started? And you know what we've done? We've succeeded in causing someone else to sin. Now, we don't make people sin, but we can be an offense to them in that way that we encourage them to sin. And that's what we've done. We've succeeded in maybe uh, separating, you know, uh, making relationships broken. And we've succeeded in probably giving ourselves an ulcer. We get more upset the more we think about it, and, and here we go. And what we have done is we have willfully and directly disobeyed the Word of God and how He says in His Word we should handle things like that. Let's say, on the other hand, we decide, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to cause all that that you just said. So this time we get offended and... We take it to the Lord, and we tell him all about it. And even in the details, we can tell him about it. And what usually happens then? Well, 
we, <laughs> very good, we feel convicted and his grace pours in. And you know what usually happens? We can be okay about whatever it was we were offended about. We can change our perspective. And then we don't have to tell anybody else because we told the Lord and he's the one that can do something about it. He can change their heart. He can change our heart. And from that, what do we get? We get peace. And we get joy in knowing that we have valued the unity of the body of Christ more than even like a temporary pleasure that we might get out of spreading gossip or just saying that one more thing about somebody. Um, the book of um, Hebrews in 12:15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and by it many are defiled. When we share, spread that kind of bitterness that we have to someone else, you know what we've done? We've planted that bitterness in somebody else. And all it takes is for a little seed to be planted. That it'll spring up, this verse says, into full-blown bitterness. And bitterness destroys. It is the most destructive thing. And the really, really, really sad thing is that most of the time we do this to the people we're the closest to. Maybe our husband or our children. When we share things about other people with them. Have you ever heard of the thing about going home on Sunday and having Rose Preacher? <laughs> you know, I shudder to think of the children who listened to a message from a man of God and, and they're not perfect, none of them are but then when they get home they hear from their parent things, you know, what, that, what was wrong with that message what was wrong and what happened, a seed of bitterness was planted in that child and is he going to listen to the pastor with the same tender ears the next week? probably not but aren't you thankful for God's mercy? <laughs> because you know what? We've all done it. But God is so merciful. And so, here are some verses that the Lord can use. He that uttereth a slander is a fool. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. A talebearer revealeth secrets. But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. And uh, we've read some of these, I'm jumping down to 2518 now. A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Again, I looked up the word maul because I wasn't sure of that. And it means abuse, bludgeon, whip, beat up, pummel. <laughs> so think about that next time before you say something bad about someone. And again, let's jump down to the contrast. 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind. Love thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the right kind of love will definitely stop that kind of tail-bearing. And then we ha see this word a lot in Proverbs, the word clamorous. That means vigorous in demands or complaints. A complainer. Loud-mouthed. <laughs> overbearing. Wearing. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 7.11, she, talking about the strange woman, is loud and stubborn. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. And you know what? These next three verses, we've read them several times, and they just apply to so many things. So I'm going to read them again. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. 
it applies to a lot of subjects, but it has to apply to this one. Nagging, nagging, nagging. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a, with a contentious and an angry woman. And a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. But again, let's notice the contrast of what God sees in a beautiful woman. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. So we can see the contrast there. And then also, speaking of complaining, a very convicting verse in Numbers 11, 1 says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. So if we want to please the Lord, we won't complain. Then the, uh, the Proverbs talks about boasting. It says, don't be quick to um, let another man praise you and not your own mouth. And, um, and then it goes on to say that we should not be hasty to speak. And again, this is another convicting one because um, James 1.19 says, Let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. So there are several problems with being hasty to speak. One of them, I think, is addressed in that, in that verse in James, that if we're so busy trying to talk and we feel like we've got to be the next one and you know, we're the only one that matters as far as the conversation, we're not listening to other people, are we? And listening to other people is very important if we're going to do some of these positive things we're going to see in a minute. But I'm not going to read all these verses on hasty to speak. But because of time. But I do want you, if when you get home or whatever, to just dwell on these verses and ask the Lord to, uh, to speak to your heart about, about that. Because there are times, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, that we should be silent. And some of these verses indicate that a fool would just be one to speak without thinking about it ahead of time. So um, that is a category. And then another major, major category, as far as our speaking in Proverbs, is lying. And one of the things that really stood out to me, and that's why I put that on your worksheet, is that out of the six things, and then it actually says six, yea, seven, that are an abomination to the Lord. He hates it, okay? And out of those seven, there were three that really stood out regarding our speech. Somebody give me those because those were your, that was one of your questions. What were the three that had to do with our speech? A lying tongue? False witness? Sowing, sowing discord among the brethren. Those things the Lord hates. And that is a very powerful thing. And, and the Bible has, look, look at all those verses and I do encourage you to study over them more later. We're not going to go over them all today. And then I actually put sowing discord as a separate category from tail bearing because I see a slight difference, but it's also very, very similar. And um, we, I think we've read most of those verses. But what a, what, you know, no wonder the Lord hates it uh, to think about that one verse says somebody who um, is a whisperer, I don't, uh, has, separates Chief friends, separates best friends. That is, that is something to really think about. The, in Proverbs it says we can, with our speech, displease the Lord by mocking. And there's two specific things that I found. Proverbs 14.9 says we should not mock sin. We should not make light and make jokes about sinful things and uh, try to make light of it. Uh, because again, if God's word, if we're trembling at God's word, we're not going to make a mock of sin. But then also it says, whoso mocketh the poor reproaches his maker. So I don't think we really have trouble in this room with, you know, you guys bullying people and all that. But if, if people that make fun of people for whatever reason and mock them, uh, who are they really mocking? And, and God, because God is their maker, this verse tells us. So it's very, that's an important thing. And then, of course, cursing is a different category. But I wanted you, uh, I, on your sheet we talked about the consequences, too, of, of sin. 
uh, of this kind of um, sinful language. What Bible character? I'm just really curious. I have one that I came up with, but, um, and I heard some of your suggestions, but I, wanna, I want you to share them. So whoever's the spokesman for your table, go ahead and share some of the people that you think are examples from the Bible of ungodly speech or death-causing speech. Okay? And it was mentioned at our table that Job's wife Okay. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, that's a good example. Good example, Job's wife. Very good. Anybody else have one? Okay, very good. Very good. These two tables have anybody to suggest? Okay, all right, very good. And this table, did you come up with one? You had a handful. Pick your favorite. Um, it's hard to do all. Just, uh, okay, read them, them all. Saul, Adam, Satan, Judas Iscariot, the ten spies, Peter, Abigail's husband. Yes, and he, he was the one, our book, our study book mentioned him, and that's very good. And the one I came up with had to do with lying, and it was Sapphira, Ananias mm -hmm. and Sapphira, but specifically, you know, now are you sure this is what you and your husband did? Oh, yeah, that's what we did. Well... It didn't end too well, but uh, yeah. Okay, good job. Good job with those. All right, let's move on then to the life-giving power. And again, these, these first three things are things that James compares our tongue to. And the first thing is a bit in the, in the mouth of a horse or a helm that steers a ship. It says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, and I didn't add this on there, but I'm going to now, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. So the tongue here is compared to a bit that you put in a horse's mouth that can make such a difference in that horse. I mean, the horse could be wild, it, it could be strong, it could be, you know, running over people. But if you, and you know, nobody's going to stop it, but that little bit, even a child could get on that horse and control it with that bit, right? And then what about uh, this boat that is out on the sea, tossed around by the waves and just maybe headed for destruction? But it can be steered and maneuvered, and the, this verse says, whithersoever the governor listeth. I thought that was interesting because that saying, wh whoever is steering the ship can just by using that helm, which is, is a small thing compared to the big boat, can direct that whole big ship. Now, what have we already seen? Who is not a good governor of that helm? Who is not a good governor of this thing right here? Good. That's what I was going to We're not. Why? Because the Bible says the tongue can no man tame. So we're not a good one for that job. Who is? Okay. The Lord is the one that needs to be in control of that. So that he can control all of us. The Bible says if we can control our tongue, we would be a perfect person. So we want the Lord controlling our tongues. And then James also describes our speech as a fountain. And it says, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? And so it's in, in reference to the tongue, it's saying that a fountain should be known and reliable for sending a certain thing. And as Christians, what should be characteristic of our lives? What should our fountain be giving off? Good, good speech, the things we're going to talk about in a minute. And it's going to go on to say, it should never be mixed. Bitter water should not be coming out of a Christian's fountain. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, and the words of a man's mouth are as, a, are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. And then Proverbs describes our tongue as a tree, which what does a tree do? 
if it's a fruit tree or you know a fruit bearing tree it's going to be nourishing and it says and these trees that he's talking about in James are they both bear fruit can a fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either a vine figs so if we're a Christian what kind of fruit should our lives bear godly fruit we should be bearing godly fruit and then uh, Proverbs says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life and then I put in this verse in Ephesians because it says let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearer I think that is an amazing thing to think about that our words can minister grace to somebody you know God is the giver of grace and it's his word that really gives grace but just as I heard someone at the table say if we are filled with God's word then that will come out of us and when it does what are we doing we are ministering grace to someone who needs it and everybody that we meet needs it so this uh, Ephesians is giving the contrast. Don't let bad fruit grow on your tree. Don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But use uh, words that are going to edify and that are going to build up. And when we talk about edifying, what are we talking about? We're talking about building other people's faith. We're talking about helping them walk closer with the Lord. We're talking about giving godly advice. You know, many times our friends, our daughters, granddaughters, possibly neighbors, come to us and say, you know, I have this thing, what should I do? And we need to be able and ready and so filled with the Word of God that we're giving godly advice, right? We're giving the advice that He would give that would truly edify them and build them up. Many times we kind of fall into the trap of giving advice that the world would give. You know, oh, just follow your heart. You know, that's, we, we need to know the difference between being able to give somebody something that is really going to be helpful to them. And that would be something that would edify. So listen to some of these verses. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be, be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. That's our goal. The lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. We need to have wisdom so that it will come out of us. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. So that means a father needs to be giving instruction, and a mother needs to be giving instruction to their children. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, and in the multitude of counselors, they are established. The sweetness of the lips increases learning. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So does the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Those are some wonderful things to think that we can use our tongue for such life-giving purpose as that. And then also kind of closely related to that is that we can use our mouths to encourage others. And uh, when you think of encouragement, um, what do you think of with, with people? You want to you wanna lift them up. Maybe it's someone who is hurting in some way. And Isaiah 50, verse 4, th that's an, this is an interesting verse. Isaiah 50, verse 4 says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth my ear to hear as of the learned. 
And, you know, I know that this verse is referring to uh, Isaiah and, and the Lord's giving Isaiah a prophecy, which he doesn't give us prophecy, but he doesn't need to because we already have all the prophecy we need in his word, and he's given us his word. And I just thought it was so interesting that it says, every morning he gives me his word. And if we, if that is our habit, that we're hearing from God, and it says, he wakeneth my ear, uh, and I just love that, that he wakeneth my ear. Why? Because he wants me then to be able to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wants me to be able to encourage other people. And I just think that's a great thing. Proverbs ten eleven: the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The lips of the righteous feed many. Heaviness in the heart of a man maketh it stoop. And we run into people all the time. Maybe even here at church. Very likely, very definitely here at church. We run into people whose heart is heavy and it's making their heart stoop. But a good word maketh it glad. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. A word spoken in due season, how good it is. The words of the pure are pleasant words. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. The lips of, the, of knowledge are a precious jewel. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. 1 Corinthians 1.4 says, Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Again, if we're letting God comfort us, we can then be a comforter, an encourager to others. And then there's other ways we can, uh, we can sing and praise God. And I didn't get those from Proverbs. Couldn't see anything specifically. But I know that that is a very important way we can use our mouth. So I put a couple of verses there. And then very, very, very important way that we can give life with our words is by sharing the gospel with other people. Proverbs 10, 21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many. A true witness delivereth souls. Have I not written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? Why? That I may make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. And then once you know the certainty of those words of truth, what does he want us to do with it? That thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send to thee. We're going to, again, we're around people all the time that don't know the Lord, and we do. We know his word. He's made it known to us. We need to open our mouths and make it known to others. Acts 4.20 says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's like they're saying, we can't keep quiet about that. That's too good to, it's too good a news not to share. We cannot but speak. We cannot keep quiet. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Okay, we were put in trust with something very valuable, the gospel. So what are we supposed to do? Speak. Speak words of life. Not as pleasing men, but God who trieth the hearts. Uh... I read this little, I'm taking uh, an evangelism class for Sunday school with Jack Samargo as our teacher. And our book, which is called Giving the Exchange, had this little th uh, testimony in there. It says, as a young professional, Clay Term Trumbull worked as, a, as an office clerk and lived in a boarding house. One day, a letter arrived from a friend back home. It clearly told him how to be saved and how to have a personal, and, and it made a personal appeal to him to receive Christ. Upon reading the letter, he knelt, knelt and readily prayed the sinner's prayer. The next day, on his way to work, he took the opportunity to introduce a co-worker to his newfound joy 
and urged him to make the same decision. Don't you just love new Christians when they hear the, the word of God and they accept it and they want to tell somebody right away? Uh, I wish we all just kept that enthusiasm all the time. But he wanted to tell somebody, so he told a, a co-worker they had worked with for years. Listen to this. With shame and conviction, his friend answered, I've been a Christian since childhood, and I've never said a word that caused you to suspect it. I see now that if that you would no doubt have received Christ if I had but opened my mouth. Isn't that convicting? And he missed out on the blessing of seeing, being the one to be able to lead this man to the Lord because he never opened his mouth. So yes, there are times when we should close our mouths, definitely. But there are times when we should open our mouths because we have the words of life. And we can share those life-giving words with others. Um, the person that I thought of from the Bible on this uh, is a Naaman's wife's little servant girl. She knew the answer, didn't she? She knew the solution to Naaman's pro problem. And she opened her mouth. She could have just as well said, well, I don't need to help him. But she opened her mouth and shared it. And what a difference it made. So the words of the righteous are wise, they're true, they're pure, just like God's words are pure. They're kind. Many verses there I'd like for you to look over, but we're about out of time. But one that I do want to point out is Proverbs 31:26 that is talking about the virtuous woman. And it says, in her tongue is the law of kindness. It's like her tongue was guided by a certain law. I can't say it if it's not kind. And you know, we as mothers and as grandmothers and as teachers and as wives uh, and neighbors and friends and everything and just people we rub shoulders with, everything we do, we can do with kindness. You can even, you can dispute um, a charge at the store that you feel like if they charged you too much, you, you know, it's okay sometimes to, to stand up, you know, to point something out. You can do it with kindness. You don't have to get mad. You don't have to, you know, lash out at the person. You can do that with kindness. You know, I think sometimes the family, or who we live with, is the easiest, they're the easiest targets for us to be unkind. I think we take them for granted, whether it be our husband Oh, you know, him, he, <laughs> I can just say anything to him. Uh, our children, the, you know, our precious children, and lots of times we do spend a lot of time with them, you know, when they're little, when we're young. And yes, we, we lose our patience, but the goal should always be you can discipline, and we should discipline them, but we can always be kind. And that's what the virtuous woman decided. I'm going to let that law rule my tongue that anything I do... I'm going to do it with kindness. And that made a difference, and it was noted in the Bible. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about then is that the tongue reveals what's in our heart. Um, Matthew 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So it's really kind of hard. We like to try to hide sometimes things that we know are in our hearts that other people don't know. And some things we can't hide. Because, you know, but one sure way to give away our heart is a, a tattletale on our heart is our tongue. It tells what's inside. And um, these verses tell us that. It says what pours out of a wicked person and what should pour out of a righteous person. And the person that I chose um, both on the good and the bad for this was... Joseph and Joseph's brothers. Um, back in Genesis, we, where we read the account of Joseph, we see in chapter 37, which is where that account starts, we see right away that Joseph's father loved him more than the brothers, which was a problem, but this, of course, got the brothers very upset. And there's a verse there, I think it's verse 4 that, in chapter 37, that says, 
that they hated him. When they saw that the father loved him, they hated him. And then it says, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now, what was motivating that? What was in their heart? Jealousy? Bitterness? Hatred? Right? How did it come out? They could not speak peaceably to him. It was, it was impossible because what was in their heart would not allow, you know, they were just probably no telling what they, you know, said to him. But then in contrast to that, the very last chapter in Genesis, which is the last chapter that talks about Joseph and his brothers, you remember the father died, Jacob died, and the brothers again, then got scared again. Oh no, now that father's gone, he's going to be able to take his revenge upon us for what we did to him. But you know what the Bible says? It says, you know, first he assured them, you know, guys, I'm not going to, I'm the same, you know, I forgave you. And the Bible says that he said, and the Bible says this, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So what this tells me about Joseph is that all those years that went by after he was sold by those brothers into slavery, put in that pit and then sold, he never got bitter towards them. How do I know that? I know it because of how he's speaking to them. That's revealing to me his heart that he did not allow, allow his heart to get bitter. The brothers allowed their hearts to get bitter, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Quickly, your Bible characters that you had for the good speech. Okay? okay on the other side of Abigail's husband was Abigail. Very good. She came down the hill, and she, you know, it was actions, but it was also kind words. She offered David... Um, all kinds of things that yes. not have been purchased at Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Chick-fil-A. Okay? But then she also said, forgive my husband for his foolish actions. And she could have said, he's a foolish man, but she did not do that. Yes. And she did speak in truth. I mean, it was obvious. Yes. So they were wise words, but we also had Esther. Esther continually had wise words. Uh -huh. Proverbs 31 woman. Uh -huh. Solomon. And then even the friendship between David and Jonathan. Very good. Good. Excellent. Excellent job. Thank you very much. And again, the contrast between Abigail and her husband, we see this contrast all through this study, don't we? Anybody else have one you really want to share? Joseph. Okay, good, good. All right. I do want to close. I know I've read a lot of verses, but I do want to close by reading these. And I just ask you again, to tremble at God's word. Therefore, with the tongue, again, we're back in James, where we've been, therefore, with the tongue, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Colossians 3, 7 to 10, in the which ye also walked sometime, you used to walk that way when you lived in them, but now ye also put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another. Why? Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we should let the word of God so fill us that these things will come out. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And then notice this, neither give place to the devil. Remember what that fire, where that fire was ignited? It was ignited 
of hell. Okay? If we, our words can help, can make us give place to the devil. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Spirit of God. Don't do things that God hates. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech be alway with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. And then, uh, I'm going to skip the next one, and you can read it, and I'm going to end with this one. Psalm nineteen fourteen says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer.